Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. You won't be able to see me. And I have somebody who can be brave and tell me that you can hear my voice, please. problems before on my newer computer. Oh, yay, you can hear me. I think I figured out the reason why <laughs> I couldn't figure it out last time. Turns out that the earphones have to be plugged into the back of this huge microphone. And I did not realize that because the microphone is so big, you can't actually see the butt end of it. Okay, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. All right. So, um, just going to give people a minute to drop in, and then we'll get this party started. And it will be recorded if for some reason um, you can't see the introductory slide or you can't see the chat box, but you can hear me. You may just want to press the, I think it's a lightning bolt on your screen. Uh, I think it's in a different place on your screen than mine. But when you press the lightning bolt, it will reload you. So if for some reason something goes wrong and you lose sound or things stall, the easiest thing to do is to actually press that button. And... Um, I'm happy to answer questions. You'll notice to the side of the chat, there's a Q&A box. It says Q&A only. So if you have a specific question, if you type it in there and post it, it's just a little bit easier than, to keep track of questions uh, rather than just in the chat box. And if you have further questions after this session, you're always welcome to contact me on resonancewellnesseducation at gmail.com or at the office is fine too. All right, so we're just going to get this rolling. So hello and welcome to Chocolate 101. My name's Dr. Alyssa Gall, and I will be your guide this evening about all things chocolatey. Now, as usual, this presentation is given in the context of the whole life medicine model. And when we're talking about chocolate, I suppose we could think about this as a missing ingredient in a way. Chocolate certainly has some interesting compounds in it that we're going to learn about today. Unfortunately, there's also other concerns that are been brought to light in recent years. So we'll talk today about what those concerns might be around chocolate and how we might handle that. I have certainly learned lots of new things in recent weeks while researching for this presentation. And I'm hoping to present a relatively balanced view of chocolate in a healthy lifestyle. But I thought we'd start by looking at the cacao tree and where we can find it. So the cacao tree is the source of chocolate. And as you can see here, there's two main zones um, that are uh, involved in cacao tree production. The green areas in the tip of or the northern side of South America are native locations for the cacao tree. So this is where they are normally found in the world. The purple areas are where cacao trees have been introduced. So the green areas that are native are Brazil, um, Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, French Guiana, Guyana, uh, Peru, Suriname, and Venezuela. But there are a lot of places across the world um, away from South America where the cultivation of the cacao tree is, uh, has been introduced. Obviously, you can see here that it's crept up into the Mexico, Belize um, kind of region. Also, the Cayman Islands, uh, China, the Cook Islands, Cuba, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Fiji, um, Ghana. Guatemala, Guinea, uh, Hainan, ha Haiti, Honduras, Ivory Coast, Jamaica, Trinidad, Vietnam. There's quite a few countries on here. 
Now you might have noticed, obviously, there's very limited locations for cacao tree growing in the world. And this is not just related to temperature and humidity. This is a jungle plant. But what is not apparent is that you also require certain insects to pollinate these trees. It's a kind of midge or how they're often known here as noceums. And also it requires particular fungal elements in the soil. So they're a bit tricky to grow, which is not why they're not under wider cultivation. I think attempts have been made to grow them in greenhouse conditions, um, but it is difficult. And trees are harvested about four times per year in jungle conditions. Um, I believe two of the harvests tend to be bigger and two of them tend to be smaller depending on the rain um, of, that, of that part of the year. Now there's a lot of history about the cacao plant. There's evidence of the use of this um, plant in Mesoamerica by the Maya and the Aztec since approximately 1900 before the common era. Um, so it wasn't originally prepared as a chocolate like we know it. It was originally prepared as a drink with cornmeal and chili peppers, or flavored with fruit juice and psychoactives, but generally a bitter hot drink with a ton of foam on top of it, which was created by pouring it repetitively from a height into a bowl, and it was not sweetened. So it was thought in Mesoamerica that the cacao plant was gifted to humans from the the god Quetzalcoatl, I'm probably just brutalizing the name, I'm sorry, but hopefully you'll all remember back to, I think it was sixth grade when we looked about Mexico. It was um, often used in battles as a ritual drink before battle. And really it was quite um, confined to this location of the world until 1519, uh, obviously the common area uh, or a common era where Cortez um came to Tenochtitlan and he was served this drink in a golden cup. It had a reputation in Mesoamerica um, as, like I said, to do with that it was a very spiritual plant. They used it for a lot of things and it was actually a lot of the time reserved for royalty or, like I said, people in battle. And um, by probably about 1700, it had spread into Europe because the Spanish brought it back. By 1800, um, there were definitely manufacturers for chocolate as we know it um, across Europe. And by 1800, I think um, a Mr. Van Houten, which I believe is still a chocolate brand, uh, introduced the cocoa press, which pushed the co cocoa butter and the cocoa solids apart. So this was a really big um, development that actually let it expand into some, the, the product that we now know as chocolate and um, cocoa. So powdered milk got added to this whole um, cocoa solids things by the late 1800s. So that was almost another 100 years later. And then a huge demand ensued. And this really encouraged slave trades um, across Europe and North Africa and the Caribbean in particular. Um, it is a $93 billion per year industry. So there was a lot of reverence for this beverage and the, the frothing, which I, you can't really see this very well on this slide, but the, the bottom right slide is showing uh, a woman using a hand tool that froths um, cacao in hot water to make the froth. Historically, it was made by pouring it from a height repetitively now that foam is like a cocoa butter foam. So it's a kind of a funny, you know, like fatty textured foam. And uh, not everybody loves this, but this is still done um, in Mesoamerica, in Mexico and other locations where um, this preparation of chocolate still continues pretty much the same way that it always has. So it has a very long and interesting history. Now, this is a picture of the cacao tree. This is how it looks. And what you can observe is that the cacao pods are dro growing directly from the bark of the tree. So this um, tree is the plant in Latin Theobroma cacao. So Theobroma in Greek means food of the gods. So Theo is God and Broma is food. And that is exactly what chocolate has been known as for centuries is the food of the gods. Now, if we take a closer look at one of these pods, what you'll see is 
mostly that there's the flesh of the cacao pod. So you, you do have to use something quite um, heavy and sharp to break this open. Uh, most of us are not familiar with the flesh of the cacao. It's a really sweet fruit that is really its own treat. And it's been used to make its own fermented beverage that's kind of like a beer. And within the flesh of the fruit is the cacao seed, uh, which you can see um, on, this, on this little right hand side here. So there's about 30 to 50 cacao beans per pod. And there's quite a few steps to chocolate production. Firstly, these pods have to be hand harvested um, so as not to damage the tree. Obviously, since we just saw that the pod is growing directly from the trunk of the tree. Then the flesh and the seeds are removed from the pods and um, they're left to ferment, often outside in big fermentation boxes that are lightly covered for five to eight days. Then the beans are dried, again in open air and covered. And in some locations, it's too humid to do this. So some are dried over fire and that kind of adds a smoky taste. Uh, it's more likely somewhere like Papua New Guinea. Um, and then this is how they're shipped uh, as dried beans. And so once they're shipped to the chocolate maker, that is where they are then roasted. This tends to open the seeds to reveal cacao nibs. Um, and, they, and then they usually use air to blow it, blow through to separate all the components. It's called winnowing, kind of like grain winnowing. And the shells of the cacao um, nibs can also be used to make other things. They're often used in cacao tea. Um, and they've also been used in fertilizer and other organic products. So then these little nibs inside are ground into a paste that's known as chocolate liquor. So if you taste a cacao nib, it's very much like almost like a coffee bean in both texture and a little bit even in taste. And the grinding process generates heat and it melts the cocoa butter from the nib. So the longer you grind, the it kind of melts and it makes a smooth chocolate. So this is the stage at which you might put some sort of flavoring agent. And then once you've got it the, tasting the way you want, you allow it to cool and set. Um, some manufacturers leave it to age um, to try and improve the flavor. And then the cocoa or the sorry, the chocolate's melted again in a process that's called tempering. Otherwise, it's too crumbly. So the temperature is raised and lowered multiple times in the process, and that changes the crystal structure in the chocolate. And so when you dry it after you've performed that correctly, it snaps. And then of course, it their chocolate is then molded and wrapped. So each pot on the tree can make the equivalent of about two bars of chocolate. Doesn't seem like very much. It's a lot of work. <laughs> now, before we go further, I have to mention two issues with chocolate. And the first is, is that there's some concern about toxicity. So for several years, data has been accumulating about the presence of heavy metals in particular cadmium and lead in chocolate. And it's not entirely clear exactly where all the cadmium and lead is coming from. Some is definitely from soil. And as with all plants, what's taken out from soil doesn't exclude the toxic elements. There's also some thought that there's more toxicity if cacao seeds dry near a roadside for existence. Um, and certainly the overall toxicity in an environment is related to lots of different practices of people in an area. So there could be factory contamination or some other industry contaminating groundwater. Um, there's different rules in a lot of the countries that are cacao producers and not all of them are better than ours. So as you can see here, the same chocolate tested more than once can show different results. So some of the variability is also the um, kind of the nature of testing for toxins in a biological substance, because not all toxins are going to be concentrated evenly throughout um, a sample. And then there's also the problem when testing humans for toxins. <laughs> That's the same problem. Humans are a bit more complex, but um, in uh, cacao, because there's so much fat, Metals are fat soluble, so you can you can actually concentrate them in that fatty part of the cacao, and that's the same as human beings. You can actually concentrate metallic toxins in the fatty tissue of the body, including the brain and nervous system, and the fat layer. So, you know, putting things in storage is both use useful and not. But you can see from this um, chart, this is. Um, from a website that is asyousow.org. 
Um, it's a website of a chocolatier who um, has been publishing um, the uh, toxicity in multiple different kinds of samples. So I'm only giving you a very, very sh small window here. I just thought I would choose a couple of popular types here and just throw them up and you can kind of see how much they vary between each other. And even like I said, amongst their own products, you'll see quite a bit of variability. Um, there's even thoughts that, you know, you might get lead on top of the cocoa bean when they're out drying, if it's near a road, you know, so you, you could, you could basically get absorbed toxins from any part of the process. It's, um, kind of unfortunate, but you know, in agriculture, um, this is not unusual. Unfortunately, organic sources do not um, necessarily eradicate this risk. In fact, some of the um, organic chocolates have just as much, if not more than some of the non-organic ones. A, a lot will probably have to do with sourcing in the world. So another major sticky wicket in chocolate production is the use of child slavery on cacao plantations. Now you remember our map that showed the African and Southeast Asian countries that have adopted cacao as a cash crop. There is some very good evidence that the socioeconomic conditions of areas in Africa, in combination probably with corrupt governments, have allowed that slavery practice to proliferate. So they, they basically use kids as labor. There have been some very good books written about this. Um, one is called Bitter Chocolate by Carol Off, which talks mainly about the practices investigated in the Ivory Coast or the Cote d'Ivoire. Dois, <laughs> My French is terrible. That's a former French colony. Um, the French have not make, made this any better from the sounds of it either. And the chocolate industry is very aware of this issue but there hasn't really been firm commitment to making child labor a thing of the past. It's quite likely to be an issue for years, if not decades to come. And the only way to change the practice at this point is for consumers to intentionally not buy chocolate that isn't marked slavery free. So here's a website um, that is showing um, ethical chocolate companies. It's probably not a like full list um, but it just websites like that do serve to kind of help you narrow down who has committed and who hasn't committed to ensuring that the source of their chocolate comes from a place where this is not a, a common practice. And certainly in South America, this is, is definitely not as common. Of course, um, the history of chocolate in North America has had its issues because it's now had several hundred years. Um, what's fascinating to me is that it was the, actually the shakers that were some of the first um, and original chocolate manufacturers. So the Cadbury family, the Fries, the Round Trees, these are all familiar chocolate brands. They're named after the Shaker families that founded companies around these products. And they were intentionally um, building idealistic factory towns um, for their workers. Um, one upstart in the chocolate industry, Milton Hershey, built Hershey, Pennsylvania on this premise as well. Fascinatingly, in the 1930s, these the same workers that kind of had these custom built communities learned how to negotiate as a group for labor rights. So perhaps this is a foreshadowing of the continued challenges of appropriately sourcing beans. I don't know, but um, we have to consider where our food comes from and how supportive it is to our desires for our planet and our society. Now, when you hear about chocolate, you probably think of your own favorites or who knows, maybe you think about the medicinal bean it originated from, but it's more common to ramble off, you know, the candy that we see in the grocery stores and commercials, but there's kind of several main types of chocolate or chocolate products cacao, which is often um, named as raw chocolate. Obviously, it's not completely raw because by the time you get that, it has been fermented and dried. Unsweetened chocolate, which is also known as baking chocolate. Bittersweet chocolate, which is dark chocolate. Semi-sweet, which is dark chocolate with added sugar and cocoa butter. Milk chocolate, which actually has low levels of pure chocolate. Sweet baking chocolate. Unsweetened uh, cocoa powder, 
which uh, has gone through a different process, and white chocolate, which is technically legally not chocolate, <laughs> but it's called chocolate. It is from the chocolate plant. It's not just actually chocolate liquor based. So cacao is derived from the cacao bean or the initial raw form of chocolate. And these beans are the seeds of the cacao tree. So commercially, you can see them in cacao nibs or cacao butter, cacao paste or cacao powder. Um, cacao powder is cold pressed, unroasted cacao beans. So there's some enzymes in the cocoa retained or the uh, cacao uh, while the fat is removed. But cocoa powder is different. It looks similar, but it's processed with high temperature roasting. So that reduces the enzymatic activity. It actually reduces the nutritional value of it. And that's important to rec uh, recognize when you're researching the health of chocolate products. So, I mean, that kind of begins the milk versus dark chocolate debate which um, in which you have to recognize that milk chocolate really contains very significantly less health promoting cacao bean in comparison to dark chocolate. Milk chocolate, of course, has some or else it wouldn't be legally considered a type of chocolate, but it's diluted with milk solids, sugar and cream. Uh, so the nutritional quality of this kind of chocolate is can be minimal, um, especially when matching it to its dark counterpart. And certainly, um, there isn't always scrupulous sourcing of the dairy products and the sugars um, in those products. And, and nowadays we see a lot of chemicals and additional molecules making their way into the chocolate products that are more in the candy category. Um, so it's important to consider because the health benefits of chocolate are directly related to the amount of cacao that's present. Overall, dark chocolate's a much healthier option. It provides a lot more antioxidants and less added sugars and fat. So a few things to look for when you're picking out the best chocolate for health are the cacao percentage. So the varieties with at least 65% cacao are recommended. Um, obviously you don't wanna see too many additives. You wanna check your ingredient label for added sugars, chemicals, uh, genetically modified uh, emulsifier, uh, emulsifiers and the an alkali in it. That's also known as Dutch processing. So there is an advantage to choosing organic in the amount of pesticides in the final product. And according to recent studies, cacao, um, cacao beans may be contaminated with multiple organophosphorus and synthetic uh, pyrethroid pesticides. So um, there was this one study that showed residues from 16 different farms in Ghana, ran tests on 13 organophosphorus, nine synthetic pesticides, and they, they found three organophosphorus. So the organophosphorus are things like um, DDT. So, you know, you're, you're seeing studies showing banned pesticides making their way into cacao. Um, and it's possible that farmers are using banned substances because that's what they have in hand. Uh, or they can get that cheaper, you know, kind of underhand, like in, in like kind of black market way. <laughs> Um, a 2022 study showed multiple banned pesticides, including DDT, in Nigerian cacao as well, at levels way above the amount, uh, allowed amount for European regulations. So the main issue with this, like I was saying before, is that because cacao is so fatty, these types of toxins are really readily absorbed by both the plant and then eventually by you. So this is a good reason to choose organic. Like I said, the metals don't make as much of a difference. Um, the sourcing does, but certainly in terms of pesticide exposure, um, you really do want to take care with the fatty product. And in a way, this is the same as when we've talked about this before, like in terms of animal products, it's more important to spend the money if you're going to eat animal products to get um, organic animal products, especially if they're known to be very fatty, like dairy products are a great example of that. And also, obviously, fruits and vegetables that are not fatty, it's really more about like how much are, are, is being sprayed on the crop um, and how sensitive that crop is. And then, of course, this is another problem with cacao. It's difficult to grow enough as it is in its natural environment if you're transplanting it into a place where it technically grows but needs a lot of support. This is one of the reasons why you're going to see a lot more of these compounds coming into it. So there's many benefits of dark chocolate, though, regardless, <laughs> um, as long as consumed in moderation. So there's many essential nutrients in dark chocolate, 
I, like I said before, there's powerful antioxidants, there's heart health boosting properties. It can lower blood pressure and improve cholesterol. It can prevent stroke and play a role in diabetes prevention and management. It helps protect the skin. It can increase cognitive function. It can reduce your stress and it'll actually help you in weight maintenance, boost your athletic performance and many more things. So let's break these down a little bit. The first is nutrition. So if you consume chocolate in moderation, a good quality dark chocolate with a high cacao content can provide a pretty decent amount of nutrients. For example, um, if you were to manage to eat 100 grams or three and a half ounce bar of dark chocolate with about a 70 to 85% cocoa, you'd get about 11 grams of soluble fiber. You get 98% of your daily allowance of manganese, 89 Um, of copper, 67 for iron, 58 for magnesium, a dose of healthy monounsaturated fats in particular, if they don't are organic probably, and many other important trace minerals. So potassium, phosphorus, zinc, selenium. But of course, eating that much chocolate daily is may not be recommended because three and a half ounces of chocolate is about 600 calories. And that's plenty of sugar. But you know, and if you can eat like a square of chocolate over time, um, you will be able to have some of those nutrients come in, maybe not your full RD value of it. Now, antioxidants are another powerful substance that's really responsible for protecting cells against oxidative stress. So that's like free radical production. And so there's a score that you can use. It's called the ORAC. I believe we've talked about this before. Um, where it's a measurement of the antioxidant activity in foods. And so to determine the value, you take the food, in this case, the chocolate, and you um, expose samples of the chocolate to free radicals and just observe how well the antioxidants um, work against the free radicals. And so there's some question about the validity of that method. I mean, it's hard to do experiments on um, exactly figuring out the quality of all foods because the reactions in a test tube are obviously not the necessary the same as they're going to be a human, but it does offer a unit of measurement to compare different foods, antioxidant content. So unprocessed cacao beans score very high on this test. So that insinuates that a high volume of biologically active antioxidants are there. One study actually showed that cacao contained more antioxidant activity, um, including the compounds that are known as polyphenols or flavanols and catechins. Um, compared to other um, uh, like fruits, like superfood blueberries and acai berries, there was actually more antioxidants in chocolate than in those some of those superfoods that are known for that. Um, so many studies are also emerging in favor of chocolate's positive role in heart health. So in Sweden, there was a study with more than 31,000 women where they ate one to two servings of dark chocolate each week for nine years. <laughs> So that was quite a project. (laughs) Their risk of heart failure decreased by a third. Um, And uh, that had a good p-value. So that means it was statistically significant. There was also another study conducted in Germany that found that eating a square of dark dark chocolate every day reduced your risk of heart attack and stroke by 39%. There was another um, study called the Zutphen Elderly Study of the Netherlands. It showed that if you consume cocoa, it reduces the risk of cardiovascular death by 50% over 15 years. And another study in the U.S. concluded that eating chocolate more than five times a week reduced the risk of cardiovascular disease by 57%. So these are pretty incredible claims for fighting what is basically now the number one killer in North America, heart disease. And um, I think it's a good enough excuse. (laughs) Now, the other thing um, is that even though it sounds a little too good to be true that eating enough chocolate protects your heart, it actually is um does offer this superpower like first of all um dark chocolate does improve um hdl uh which is the cholesterol moving the cholesterol away from the vessels and lower ldl so the cholesterol that goes towards blood vessels so over time this causes basically less cholesterol um inflammation in the cardiovascular system and consuming dark chocolate can also lower blood pressure 
in blue, uh, improve the blood flow through the heart and aid in blood clotting where it's necessary. It also plays a role in reducing the risk of stroke fairly significantly because of this capacity to improve blood vessel health. So you just improve blood flow to the brain. And in a Canadian study, the individuals that eat chocolate regularly were 22% less likely to suffer from a stroke versus those who did not eat chocolate. And those who had a stroke already, um, but consumed chocolate regularly, had a 46% less chance of their stroke being fatal. So that's a pretty nice brain protective effect. Um, Italian researchers um, showed that there's a relationship between dark chocolate and diabetes, and the results were surprisingly in favor <laughs> of eating chocolate. In fact, dark chocolate um, was shown to increase nitric oxide production, improved markers of insulin sensitivity, and decreased um, fasting insulin and glucose levels. So, of course, those benefits are present only when you eat them in moderation. So a square or two every um, other day or so is probably efficient and pretty delicious. Now, um, the flavanols or phytonutrient compounds found in cacao contribute to sun protection for your skin. So research conducted in London addressed how the flavanols affect how um, a sudden or uh, or intense of a sunburn developed on participants. So those who were consuming chocolate with high flavanols took twice as long to develop initial reddening of a sunburn versus those who were eating other low flavanol chocolates. So maybe dark chocolate shouldn't be your main skin protection. It does really help out. And if you're planning to be in the sun for an extended period of time, you can think about adding some dark chocolate in your diet to uh, utilize those skin protecting benefits. Um, now, high quality dark chocolate can benefit your intelligence, right? So you heard that chocolate makes you smarter. I ate Smarties when I was a kid. Can you tell? <laughs> I don't think they had that much cacao in them, frankly. Um, but it does improve blood flow to parts of your brain that are known to contribute to performance and alertness. And while that concentration boost is not age specific, Studies have been conducted specifically on the elderly to measure how chocolate affects their cognitive ability, and results show that the flavanols work to improve the brain power and verbal fluency and several risk factors associated with different cognitive disorders like dementia and Alzheimer's, which is a specific type of dementia, of course. Now, stress affects everyone, some people more than others, but it's a part of everyday life. But the good news is that chocolate helps to reduce stress. So in moderation, chocolate can significantly reduce the stress um, or the release of the stress hormone cortisol and the common metabolic effects that the stress hormones have on the body. So, um, I mean, it's no longer a surprise that if life gets stressful, it isn't uncommon for people to reach for a little chocolate. <laughs> Now, eating sweets such as chocolate are usually shamed in the diet world. You know, we're accustomed to equating candy and um, weight gain on anything that kind of looks vaguely like dessert. So, but there were researchers at the University of Copenhagen that said that dark chocolate actually lessens cravings for sweet, salty, and fat foods. Um, and so if you indulge in a small amount of healthy dark chocolate, you can stay on task for weight management by making it overall easier to stick to a diet long term. And so that could be a win for certain. Um, one of the flavanols in chocolate is epicatechin that increases the production of nitric oxide in the blood vessels and in the body. So nitric oxide expands the um, blood vessel diameters. So in a study that was um, conducted in the United Kingdom, cyclists who were consuming like an epicatechin rich dark chocolate used less oxygen when cycling at a moderate pace compared to those who ate white chocolate instead. And so that research is suggesting that dark chocolate is um, beneficial for endurance athletes to help per boost the performance and be as efficient as possible during long events. And there's one sports analysis lecturer named James Browner and he's quoted as saying, when performing an endurance-based activity, being as economical as possible and energy provision is key to enhancing performance, 
From our results, the consumption of dark chocolate has altered the participant's response to the activity and therefore can enhance endurance performance. So um, even though it might seem counterintuitive, you could take your chocolate on a bike ride. <laughs> Now, there's other health benefits associated with consuming um, dark chocolate, um, skin detoxification, uh, a reduction in hair loss, improved mood, anemia uh, improvement, cough relief, um, PMS cramp uh, and cramp allevi uh, alleviation. Uh, it has a positive neurological impact and improves vision. It can actually be used as a remedy for digestive distress. So, I mean, some of these are kind of surprising, but there actually is um, good evidence for all of those pieces. Now, too much of a good thing can obviously be harmful. And while dark chocolate is offering plenty of health benefits, it's still got a fairly high calorie count and often a sizable amount of sugar to make it more palatable to North American tastes. So it's best to be mindful um, and that you consume this superfood in moderation. You know, if you're not in the habit of eating dark chocolate, it may not be a bad idea to slowly morph over the percentage um, up into the more therapeutic range. Now, it takes sometimes a little bit of time to get used to that, especially if you grew up on some of the stuff that's a little less um, uh, cacao-based. Now, um, and ideally organic, if you can find it, and um, ideally slavery free. Now, I just wanted to share today one of my favorite little side activities with you, and that is microfinance lending. So I don't know if you've heard of this or not, but microfinancing is lending to people who need money for business that wouldn't normally be able to borrow kind of based on their location or industry or based on availability in their area. So in microfinancing, you lend the money and then you get paid back. So I've used probably about $150 US in a circular fashion. I've lent it out probably four times over and gotten it all back. Um, sometimes there's a currency-based loss that you might share or somebody might default on a loan. But overall, that $150 bucks has made 31 loans in 18 countries since I started. So I like to fund agriculture that's organic. Um, or women in entrepreneurship, especially in agriculture. So, or the odd sock maker. I had, I funded a sock maker that makes wool socks in the Andes that needed a new machine. So <laughs> if you want to help also, I'd like to invite you to go and lend 25 bucks to a group of window, uh, our uh, group of women growing organic cacao in Peru. So I'm going to put this link up beside and I'll put it up on the Facebook um, pages as well. Um, but this is a picture here of a group that is um, in Peru. And I, my Spanish is even worse than my French. <laughs> so I'm not going to attempt to say their name. But um, they're basically um, uh, uh, borrowing money to improve their production. And so the one lady on the left here, she's a 34-year-old single mother. And basically, she has a six-year-old daughter. She's very hardworking. She's very persevering. And for the past 10 years, she's been growing organic cacao. So her greatest challenge has really been caring for and maintaining and fertilizing the crops organically so she can achieve a good production. And right now, her greatest wish is to improve the care she's providing for her crops to get a better quality. And um, she also works as a day laborer to earn extra income in the same industry. So she's going to use um, her portion of the Kivo loan to buy compost and pay for labor so she can provide a better quality product. So if you're interested at all in like being part of the change you see, want to see in the world, this is one way to do it. Um, and you can join the resonance wellness team. I've just decided to make a team because I was inspired by the chocolate lecture to find slavery free organic chocolate. And I'd like to encourage that in the world. So if you're interested in that, um, I put up the link in the chat and I will again, um, put that into the Facebook group. So questions, I've got one question from Rui. What about chocolate with nuts? too many calories. Yeah. I mean, you can, can, you can count it as like a serving of fats for sure. Um, chocolate with nuts, um, are 
I mean, it depends, I guess, on the nuts and the quality of the nuts as well. I mean, I think chocolate with nuts is fine, but you just can't eat as much of it for sure. Lots of calories, that's for sure. But good fats. And if their nuts are well treated and the chocolate's good quality, it's not the worst case scenario. Oh, and I see you saw that you've, you've done some microfinancing as well. Yeah, it's, it's a cool thing. So if anybody's inspired to do that, um, it's really amazing the difference you can make. And um, it's fun to just, you know, watch it go out and then watch people pay it back. It's, you know, and we're not talking about huge loans either. Like I said, you don't have to put in thousands of dollars. You can basically just lend 25 bucks to somebody and be part of their process. Um, it's been pretty amazing to see the different opportunities um, open up for people. I've um, definitely done a lot of organic agriculture funding in my years as a Kiva supporter. Now I want to point out that we're going to have a new webinar series. So the webinar series always starts in um, May. Um, so this obviously is the first webinar. Our next one is going to be September and that'll be a functional approach to metabolic syndrome. There'll be one in November on brain-based wellness techniques, one in February about cravings. And in May, we're going to talk about the power of plants. That's in our alleviate webinar series. And um, there are also a handful of events for the Dr. Mom set. So if you have children, we're going to be doing healthy snacking. And uh, in August and in March, we're going to talk about functional autism awareness. That might be nice to catch even if you don't have um, any experience at all with autism. I feel like the rates of autism are going up substantively um, in, uh, North America and worldwide. And it's something that people ought to be aware of. Now, obviously heartfelt appreciation for the best patients and visitors ever. <laughs> so thank you for showing up and learning. And I guess that means time for chocolate. So one more question from Laura. Is there any chance of cacao on the SIBO diet? Hmm. I, I wonder if raw, uh, raw cacao would actually be fine, like a cacao nibs. Have you ever tried that, Laura? Um, I actually don't know. I know that... Um, I know that, um, I mean, you're doing a lot of fermentation that's transforming a lot of the carbohydrates. It might be worth as, um, as a try. I mean, like cacao nibs, you wouldn't take a lot of them in anyways, you know, it might be a teaspoon or a tablespoon in the day. Yeah. Can you do a reset, um, test on dark chocolate? Potentially. Yeah. A reset. Yeah. Can resetters do dark chocolate? Hmm. I think probably not in the middle of it because it is kind of a fat. Um, you know, maybe in the fat introduction, there might be some room for that. Yeah. I don't think not in the uh, release phase, maybe in the maintenance phase as a fat is what I'm thinking, Ange. All right. Well, I think I've answered all the questions. Hopefully I've inspired you to maybe come make a Kiva contribution to our lovely ladies that are growing organic cacao in Peru. And um, probably everybody's pretty hungry right now to go find themselves a square of hot chocolate or uh, a dark chocolate. So please have some fun tonight <laughs> and we'll see you at the next event. All right. Bye ladies and gentlemen.